Hello and welcome to the next in our series for of remote learning hacks where we explore different activities you could do for um, middle school, high school level type science. And uh, we are featuring different modules that were written by teachers in South Dakota when they partnered with a scientist in South Dakota to learn about the research that they were doing and to try to make those connections in the classroom. And uh, today I have Dr. Scott Wood with me from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Um, but before I have him talk about what he's doing, I just wanna remind everybody about where the portal is located. So if you go to the internet and you do a search for EPSCoR STEM portal, um, you will find a web page that basically has um, a list of all of the different units that have been written so far and the scientists that are associated with those units is in an, an additional column. And you can actually email the scientists directly. You can download the unit and um, then use it um, in your home or in the future in your classroom. Many of these are there. You will see that there's two versions, one for middle school and one for high school. Um, but honestly, a lot of the activities you could kind of interchange between the different grade levels, depending on, on what you want to do. And typically there's some additional information at the end where you can kind of add extensions and make it a little bit more challenging. The other neat thing about these modules is that they've been purposely written to have um, inquiry opportunities that are pretty low budget and easy for just about anybody in the state to access. Um, which is why they're actually really great for doing home-based learning. And you'll notice that, um, Dr. Wood is connected to two different units. One of them is on arthritis and um, feedbacks in cellular systems. And the other one is specifically related to proteins. Um, and those proteins are involved in that feedback loop. Um, so this is where you can find the modules and we will have a link to this website on our Facebook page, um, as well as the YouTube channel. For those of you who need access, you can always email us too and we can help you find that information. So with that, I'm going to have Scott talk about what he does, and then we will show you an activity that you can do at home. Hi, everybody. Um, so if we uh, show the PowerPoint slides here. Um, OK, I am going to try to control this while still making sure that it. OK, um, Bree, is that showing up correctly for you? No, yes. You're good to go. OK, good to go. All right, so um, so my research is all about uh, arthritis, like Bree mentioned. And I am specifically studying um, how biomechanical signals help to regulate the homeostasis of the cells in our cartilage, which are called chondrocytes. Um, so we do this in a, a couple of different ways. One way we can do it is to take very small magnetic beads that are about one-tenth as large in diameter as a human hair is, uh, and they're magnetic. So we can coat them in proteins that will bind and then use a magnet. As you can see on the right-hand side, they're moving up and down over the cells on a microscope, and we can watch how the cells respond to the forces applied by the magnet moving uh, in real time. Uh, another thing that we can do, one of the things we can look at on that microscope is we can use molecular tension sensors. So we can actually apply force to specific proteins within the cell by doing or in that way uh, and look at how those force change based on uh, how we stimulate those cells. We can also use a tool called atomic force microscopy um, to look at different things. So here I have kind of a cartoon of two different experiments that we do. And in one, we are uh, coating beads of that same size with those same proteins, and we put them on the cell and we yank on them uh, until the, they come off of the cell. And we can measure the amount of force that it takes to do that. Uh, in the other experiment there, we can just rest the bead on the cell and just watch how the cell pushes and pulls on the bead itself. And that lets us look at kind of what the normal level of force for these proteins is and what the maximum amount is. And we think we're, we're trying to work toward this. Um, you know, if we apply the amounts of force that are closer to that maximum, that we're going to get uh, what we call catabolic signaling, where the cells will actually um, start to do things that will break the tissue down and lead to arthritis. Whereas 
if we apply forces that are just a little bit above the, the kind of the basal, the minimum level that they're, the cells are used to pulling uh, themselves or experiencing themselves, then we should get what we call anabolic signaling, which is the other side of the homeostasis picture, which helps to build the tissue up and uh, give you healthy cartilage. Uh, one of the microscopes that we can use for these experiments is a brand new kind of microscope. It's only about, it was invented about five years ago, uh, six years ago, somewhere in there. Um, it's called a lattice light sheet microscope, and it lets us get a very uh, realistic 3D picture of cells. Um, you can see a cartoon on the right. I did not make that uh, image or this movie. This came from the publication in which this type of microscope was initially um, presented to the public. But this is an image or a movie that we generated with that microscope for a different project. Um, but you can see here um, the sorts of images that we can get. Uh, so this is looking at uh, pinocytosis of a, a macrophage, so basically cell drinking, and you can see how the cell is kind of putting up these big ruffles and it's taking in fluid, which is invisible in the image. Anything black you can imagine is just fluid here. Um, and we can look at the cells in a variety of different ways as a solid surface, or we can make a mesh out of it so that we can kind of see what's going on on the inside of the cell. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of kind of the power of this microscope. Specific to my research, this is a, a series of images we took with that microscope. And you can see here, the, this is all one cell. On the top, we're looking at the cell from above. On the bottom, we're looking at the cell from the side. And these are the sorts of, you know, the images on the bottom here, the side view. Those are images that this is really the only type of microscope in the world that can generate an image of that quality looking at it from the side. Um, and so here we can, you know, we're looking at uh, what's called, uh, it's a protein called actin, which is a very structural protein in these cells that helps to regulate their homeostasis. Uh, and we can see that uh, by treating them with a certain drug, we can change the motion. And this drug, we've also, I don't have the data here, but um, this same drug also drastically alters the homeostasis of these cells and causes them to release proteins that will break down the cartilage. So our goal with this project ultimately is to take the structure and motion of that actin network, uh, combine it with the amount, you know, measurements of the amount of force that are within uh, the proteins of these cells, and use that to generate a model of how the cell's stasis is related by these biomechanical forces applied both from within the cell through that actin network or from outside of the cell like we were doing with the magnetic beads. Um, and you can see, uh, just to give you an idea of what our facilities look like here, um, and this, these are different pictures of our labs and the microscopes that we're using for these projects. That is, that is what I do. Well, thank you. And this is actually perfect that you are uh, on today because next week we'll have Jevin Myrink on the oh. live feed to talk about his research. Awesome. And um, and a unit that was written specifically about the work that he's doing with uh, titanium nanotube surfaces and osteoblasts, but also that module does focus a little bit on the physics of the microscope itself and why that type of microscope is is mm -hmm. beneficial for what you guys are trying to do. So that's actually really cool, yeah. and it got me thinking too. Actually, in terms of a personal connection, um, my daughter has bilateral club feet, and that's caused by mm -hmm. uh, tendons being too short, but also um, people who have that condition actually have a completely different matrix of connective tissue um, mm -hmm. and have shorter muscle fibers and tend to have a different kind of collagen matrix and are more prone to arthritis. And I wonder if, you know, that's kind of, I think initially people have thought, well, it's probably just more about stress injuries and the all the things in terms of like, if you have relapses and fibrosis in the foot, but I wonder how much of it is also kind of related to does the actual matrix and type of collagen that gets laid down matter in terms of that, those stressors that you're talking about and why one Absolutely. population might be more at risk than another. Yep. And it's going to change the way that those forces are transmitted to the interior of the cell, which is ultimately what uh, affects their gene expression and, you know, the 
making of proteins that are either beneficial or detrimental for the cartilage. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. Now I've got some other ideas in my head too of how we could use your research to do some additional type of science learning, especially some physics. Um, being a physics teacher, I've been thinking about that with your presentation. So yeah, we today, though, we're going to focus on biology and life science. And the, the experiment that I'm going to model for everybody has to deal with this idea of homeostasis, which is basically all living things um, kind of need balance, right? And homeostasis is basically about that balance within our systems. And so a really easy way for you to model this and think about this at home is to actually count how many breaths you take in a minute and how, what your heart rate is in a minute. Um, while you're resting. And then the, the guiding question for your experiment would be why or what happens to your breathing and your heart rate when you exercise? And, um, and then to actually observe and measure that because when we are physically active and you actually start to, your heart rate goes up and your breathing increases, that is because it's a response to your body's needs to, um, to remove carbon dioxide from your, your body that your cells are producing because they've increased cellular respiration. But it's also weight, it's also your body saying they, it needs more oxygen as well. And so the way you do that is you breathe and the, those gases are delivered through blood. And so both of those systems of your body then have to work harder to get all of that there. And a trick to doing this, um, you don't have to sit and count for a whole minute, find your pulse in your neck, and count beats for 15 seconds and then multiply by four and you will have about how many beats you have per minute. Um, and then you don't have to actually sit there and time yourself for 60 seconds. So that's a really, really easy experiment you can do where you can look and see how physical activity um, plays a role in those kinds of feedbacks with your body in terms of um, whether or not you start breathing harder or your heart rate increases. But another really cool one you can do at home dealing with cells actually has to do with an enzyme that our cells produce and pretty much all living um, organisms produce this enzyme and it's called catalase. And an enzyme is a protein um, and protein, this particular enzyme proteins, their jobs are kind of like chemical scissors. So usually they're going to they're going to be involved in breaking up other molecules into smaller pieces so our bodies can use them for different things or to get rid of them or they're helping kind of um, be a catalyst to get, to get other um, types of chemical reactions going in our bodies. And sometimes those enzymes are involved in cell signaling and your cells taking in different molecules and, or getting rid of them. And catalase's job is specifically dealing with when our bodies produce molecules that are actually kind of harmful for us. And hydrogen peroxide is actually one of those molecules. And catalase will actually help break hydrogen peroxide down into oxygen gas and water, and then our body reuses those. So I have an experiment set up with the NerdCam, and this experiment uses yeast, and uh, yeast is a living organism. And um, what I did is I created a solution of yeast with water and some sugar, and that's what's in this. And then um, just a little bit of sugar just to activate the yeast. And then in each of these cups, I have dish soap. And the reason I'm using the dish soap is that it helps us see the gas production that's happening. Um, and so with yeast, you'd see a little bit of gas production because obviously it's still going to be eating the sugars and going through cellular respiration. Um, to a certain extent, obviously the soap might be a bit of an irritant to the yeast cells. But in this first one, I just have soap and water. And then I have soap, water, and yeast. And then I have, in these three, I actually have different amounts of hydrogen peroxide with the yeast and the soap. So this one had one tablespoon, this one had two, and I'm sorry, this one had three, and then this one back here had two tablespoons of hydrogen peroxide. And then I was, um, so before I go into the rest of those, what I was, what I'm trying to see is if the yeast are producing catalase, then, and the hydrogen peroxide is being broken down into a gas, and water, then you should see more bubble production as the gas and that water kind of interacts with the soap to make those bubbles, which would be just like if you blew through a straw into a cup with soapy water into it and created more bubbles. This one, I was actually interested to see what would happen, how would pH affect the living organisms and their ability to produce the catalase. And so in this case, I actually added some vinegar um, to see what that would do. 
And then another interesting thing is, is that plants actually also produce catalase because plants use cellular respiration just like we do. And so, and cauliflower is a really great source of catalase. So I had some rice cauliflower in my freezer and I wasn't even sure if it would work because it's been frozen and it's not fresh. Um, but I do have cauliflower with some hydrogen peroxide and soap and there's a little bit of um, foam production. And then I was wondering if the vinegar would affect the catalase or the cauliflower cells like it would the yeast cells. And then I just have a control over here with just water and cauliflower. And I'm not, the results from the cauliflower aren't super great. Um, I think it'd be more interesting if it was fresh and then it went in a blender and it was pureed and then kind of strained and you had a fresh supply. Liver is also a great source, but I don't have any liver in my house and I'm not a big fan. Um, so, but yeast is really easy to use and um, it actually got really great results. And so um, this would be a really easy experiment that you could set up at home and you could, in, you could come up with a variety of different questions to think about how does, um, how do enzymes interact with cells? How are they involved in different types of processes? And in this case, specifically thinking about homeostasis and feedback, the yeast are producing, um, I didn't, so the yeast would actually be producing some hydrogen peroxide through their own cellular processes. And they would need to get rid of it so that it doesn't kill them. And so they would produce the enzyme then to break it down. And so there's a, there's gonna be a receptor within the yeast that's gonna say, that's basically gonna signal and say that there's hydrogen peroxide release catalase and so on. Um, I kind of boosted that reaction by adding more hydrogen peroxide to the system so that the yeast were reacting in a more um, intensive way. So, and you can see that because the one jar with just yeast and water, there isn't as much foam being produced. So the other things you could look at is heat and how heat affects the organisms and that feedback. Um, there's a whole variety of different things that you could try to think about how, um, how these feedback systems work in our bodies and um, how living organisms respond to different types of stimuli. So are there any questions today? I don't know if there is, but um, Dr. Wood, do you have anything to add? No, I, I don't think that's a really uh, great experiment. I, I, yeah. uh, well, I'm happy it worked because the first one I tried this morning wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to rethink what to do and did some internet search searching and I figured mm -hmm. out the soap as the option. So I'm glad it worked. Yeah, no, I, well, thank I, you. The, uh, yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, next week, we'll have Jevin with us to talk about his work with osteoblasts and titanium implants. So thanks for watching.